Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's joint AHDB and BCVA webinar. My name is Sarah Peterson from the BCVA board, and I'll be chairing tonight. Following the presentation, there will be the opportunity to have your questions answered, so please type any that you may have in the Q&A box during the webinar, and I'll save them for the end. If you have any technical difficulties, then please let us know by using the chat box, and we'll do our best to assist you. You can also in insert your questions into the Q&A box. Um, if you can't see the Q&A box or the chat box, then please wiggle your mouse and it should become um, a, a visible at the bottom of your screen. Please do not use the raise hand function as we cannot contact you directly. So please again, use the chat box. That's the housekeeping bit done. So now on to the aim of tonight. I'm first of all going to hand over to Steve West from AHDB, who's going to tell you a little bit about the current CARF initiative and then he will hand over to our main speaker tonight, Dr. Mike Overton. Over to you, Steve. Oh, thank you, Sarah. Um, so um, thank you for all those who, who don't know me. My name is Steve West and I'm a uh, Knowledge Exchange Manager at AHDB. Um, and it, it's great to see such a great turnout to this webinar. So thank you all for that. Now, uh, as AHDB, um, we're always keen to work closely with vets and make sure we can influence how farmers um, are managing health and welfare. Um, we know how trusted the farm vet is in the information cycle. And with this webinar and a webinar that we're going to be offering for farmers next week, we want to help galvanise the need for farmers to work with their vets on this very subject. And it is that time of year where it starts to slip to the top of the priority list. Um, the farmer web webinar that we've got next week, um, it's a lunchtime webinar and it's on the 6th of October and I will send you an email after tonight with a link to send to your clients. So please do signpost that. Uh, the content is broadly the same, but set out ever so slightly differently. So those slides and these can be made available to you all after today uh, in slightly different formats. Um, so, Mike, if you could click on to the next slide. There we go. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so uh, what I just want to um, talk through here is um, some of the tools and resources that we've got available at AHDB. Um, we can make a lot of these available for any vet meetings that you, that you might have with your clients um, and, and we're happy to support those meetings. So we have a calf management guide and a lot of this information in, in a farmer friendly manner is available in that guide. Uh, we've got a series of calf management videos um, and we actually have a heifer rearing cost calculator, which can be quite enlightening for, for a lot of farmers um, trying to work out their costs. Today, uh, I think Mike is going to look at a little bit uh, into the costs and uh, I ought to really introduce Mike. Um, so. Uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, who is who's Dr. Michael Overton. Um, I'd also like to thank Zoetis for making it possible for Michael uh, to support this campaign for us uh, today. Um, Mike has a strong background in reproduction, transition and heifer management. Um, he's worked in practice for, for eight years following the completion of his veterinary qualifications at North Carolina State University. Um, following completion of a dairy production medicine res residency, um, he has, um, excuse me, sorry, um, and his master's of preventative veterinary medicine degree at UC Davis. He went on to work as a dairy production medicine specialist at Tula, California. Next, he served as a professor of dairy production medicine and chief of service for the food animal program at the university of georgia from 2006 to 2012. in, in 2012 dr overton joined elanco animal health in a data analytics capacity and a consultancy role uh, in march 2020 he joined zoetis as global dairy platform lead within the precision livestock farming area and this is where he sits today so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mike and over to you, Mike. Please. All right, thank you very much. And uh, thank you all for joining this evening. I appreciate your uh, 
coming out to tune in to the presentation and, uh, and I'm happy to be able to share some things with you. I was joking with Stephen, uh, let's see, before we got started here about uh, lamenting the fact that I could not be over in the UK with you guys for this, but uh, anyway, I'm happy to present some of my work with you tonight. So I am going to talk a bit about management of dairy replacement heifers and try to understand a bit more about the cost of raising heifers. And I'm going to try to wrap things up at the end about a little bit around the cost of respiratory disease in the dairy replacement heifers. So with that, we'll kick off this uh, presentation. And I'm going to start off by just talking a little bit about goals for the replacement heifer program. So when we talk about replacement heifers, I think it's important that we begin with the end in mind. And by that, I know we're dealing with how we feed, how we raise these calves, but we need to think about what is our ultimate goal. And so our goal is to try to achieve in an efficient and economical manner the production of high quality, healthy replacement heifers that have the genetic background, the frame, the body condition, and of course the management preparation or background in order to have a nice early breeding uh, and calving at a appropriate age. And I'm suggesting here that that's probably 13 to 15 months of age for first service and calving at 22 to 24 months of age. <clears throat> now, we also want these animals following parturition to experience minimal metabolic disorders and infectious problems. Of course, we want these animals to have the ability to reach their milk production potential in first lactation and to conceive again in a timely manner. And of course, overall, we're trying to yield um, higher profits for the producer while also having a healthy, uh, well cared for um, cow. So requirements to make this happen, there are many things that are important along the process. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about a number of these uh, this evening, but of course we can't cover everything, but I'm just gonna hit a few things kind of on a high level. We need to have an adequate and efficient rate of growth. And when I'm talking about efficient, what I'm talking about is growing an adequate frame and lean tissue accretion in these animals instead of short, dumpy, fat heifers. And one of the things I'm going to point out to you is that some of the most efficient gains an animal's going to have ever are going to be very early in life when they're most efficient with the utilization of protein in terms of converting nutrients into uh, growth from a frame as well as a um, total body accretion perspective. We need good health to have optimal growth and development. Um, we know that disease issues can lead to health problems, mortality, culling, whether as a heifer or as a cow. We also want to focus on improving the immunity and that starts right off, right at birth with the administration of colostrum and it continues with adequate um, nutrition and of course vaccination. I will not be talking at all about vaccinations on this presentation, but that's not to mean that it's not important. It's just so much variation by geography in terms of what we vaccinate animals for. But good health also includes minimizing disease challenges. And this is what I'm gonna spend a lot of time on this evening is what are the management things that we can do to try to avoid um, infections or disease challenges. And that gets into housing, ventilation, air quality, bedding management, sanitation, and of course, nutrition. And of course, we gotta have timely and efficient breeding. We've had situations in the past, unfortunately, where I've investigated in herds, where they've done a great job with some of the growth and development, and then it just falls apart when it gets to the reproductive management of these heifers. So we need to have good reproduction reproductive performance and management in order to capitalize on these other earlier life um, performance gains. <clears throat> now, calf and heifer nutrition affects many, many things. Um, to me, this is one of the most overlooked areas from a heifer perspective. For the young calf, a good nutritional program uh, uh, obviously allows it to have the growth that we are targeting. But it also, and this is a really important concept to point out to your producers, Increased level of nutrients, calories, protein, help this calf cope with cold stress. And I know that your environment can be quite chilly at times, especially with the moisture in the air. And so that's a big challenge for these calves in the, the winter times is dealing with the cold stress. And that affects their immune function, affects their health, and affects their rate of gain. 
So as we transition from this young calf to an older heifer and all the way into uh, adulthood as a lactating cow, nutrition all the way back to the young calf can affect things like age at first calving. It can affect calf carryover effects on milk production and first lactation. And of course, how we handle these animals from a health perspective, uh, a growth perspective affects their longevity and their lifetime economics. One of the more commonly stated goals is that we want heifers to double the birth weight by 60 days of age. I'm going to contend that's a very, very meager goal. I'd like to see calves more than double the birth weight. If we look at a hypothetical scenario where you have a 40 kilo calf going to 80 kilos by 60 days, that's an average daily gain of about 0.67 kilos per day. That's very, very modest. What is actually uh, very achievable is uh, much higher, 0.85 kilos per day. And if you remember that two tenths of a kilo difference I'm pointing out right here, we'll talk about that a bit more, but that's going to be roughly equivalent to an expectation of a little over 300 liters more milk in the first lactation. So just remember that for just a second and we'll come back to that. Now, from a traditional perspective, I'm talking historically now, um, calf feeding and management was not exactly ideal. Um, calves were often fed a very limited level of milk in order to quote unquote save money. And that unfortunately did lead to some savings, but not in terms of producing a healthy calf. They also ended up weaning calves at a specific age versus utilizing some other targets. They started breeding heifers at a specific age rather than incorporating growth and frame size. Um, most of the producers and consultants, unfortunately, viewed the calf and heifer program primarily as a cost area rather than an opportunity area. And unfortunately, still sometimes today, rations are formulated on a least cost per day basis instead of focusing on the efficiencies uh, affordable through the by looking at cost per unit of gain. And if you look at all this and pull it all together, we often wondered why heifers had so many health problems after calving and why they didn't, didn't perform as well as expected. But I'll contend that if you think about this, it's really quite obvious, isn't it, in terms of why they didn't perform as well as we might expect. So in terms of some of the reasons, or primary reasons that calves get sick, and I'm focusing right on this slide prior to weaning, to me there are some really important factors. We'll start off with an inadequate level of protection. We can basically focus that on colostrum. So colostrum is critical, as we all know, in terms of getting an adequate amount in the calf, of us uh, an adequate quality, and of course timing is critical so that we can um, get the right amount into the calf for an absorptive perspective. I used to joke with my students that it was a race. It was a race to get colostrum into the calf before the bugs got there, before E. coli, and before all the environmental pathogens got into the gut. So we're trying to get that colostrum in the gut first and uh, time it ahead of the pathogen exposure. Speaking of which, these calves have to deal sometimes with the high exposure to pathogens, whether it's bacteria, as I just mentioned, or viruses or cryptosporidia. Again, I used to tell students, it's not a matter of if calves are exposed to crypto, it's a matter of when. And my goal was to try to get the nutritional management up to a high enough level that these calves could actually tolerate the crypto without having much of a challenge. And then she, uh, those calves could just continue growing beyond that. But unfortunately, if we didn't provide sufficient calories or protein intake, whether it's through inadequate or insufficient colostrum feeding, maybe not providing transition milk, which I'll talk about more in a few minutes, or simply um, failing to provide an adequate amount of milk or milk replacer, that creates additional stresses. So it, not only do the calves not grow well, but they're actually more susceptible to the, some of the classic pathogens they may be exposed to from time to time. Improper environmental management has a key role here, and one of the biggies here is going to be air quality. I've been in a number of UK farms. I know how some of the young calves are housed. I know at times it can be a bit overcrowded in some of these indoor environments, and I know air quality can be quite a challenge, and that's something we uh, have to be careful not to overlook. In addition to that, we've got the temperature stress, the cold and dampness that can create big time challenges from a thermal regulation perspective for these young calves. Now, as we move 
past weaning and look at some of the young heifers to growing heifers, um, there's some, some unique things here in terms of why they may be getting sick. Again, to me, one of the most important is this idea of uh, poor transition management. In other words, we d haven't done a good job of transitioning these calves from a milk-based diet to a grain-based diet. We've had inadequate gut development and inadequate nutrient intake during this transition time period. And this is why shortly after weaning, oftentimes between one and three weeks after weaning, we'll see a lot of heifers break with respiratory disease. And it's simply because of this poor transition that they just aren't getting the, the nutrient intake they need to help continue to support their immune system. Of course, on top of this, we sometimes deal with inadequate environmental management. Again, there's the two biggies, the, the temperature stress, which becomes less of an issue, but does not go away in these older heifers. But air quality becomes an even bigger challenge in the older heifers, especially when we have indoor housing in group pens um, without really good um, air ventilation. Of course, um, having a disease issue like respiratory disease as a calf predisposes an heifer to having more issues later. So that's a big challenge, as is continued exposure to pathogens or inadequate acquired immunity. Here I'm thinking primarily around the vaccine um, strategy. Are we doing the right vaccines at the right time against the right pathogens? Are, these, are we setting the calves up for success or not? So here's a bit of my own personal opinion, but in my opinion, a large majority of dairy cattle health problems are management related. I used to joke that many of the problems we deal with on a farm have a first and a last name. And really what I'm talking about is a lot of times they can be, the issues are, are related to how we as people managing the animals fail to do our job. Um, so what this means is that many of the health issues that we confront on a daily basis can actually be prevented with the right strategy, the right management, the right execution. And I try to encourage my students over the years to focus on targeting the prevention rather than simply detection and treatment. We do our animals much more good doing this. We do our producers a better job if we can focus on how do we minimize the risk of disease rather than simply focusing on detecting and treatment, disease, treatment of disease as it occurs. In the calf and heifer area, there are two primary disease issues we're focused on. In the very young calf, the, the primary issue tends to be calf diarrhea. And again, I think that's primarily a hygiene and nutritional uh, related issue. Housing issues can play a role too. And this is again, primarily the first 30 days of life for the classic neonatal diarrhea issues. Respiratory disease is probably the biggest challenge we have in calves and heifers. Uh, it can be associated with poor nutrition. It can be associated with air quality issues and housing. The other thing to keep in mind is that uh, we often see respiratory disease occur uh, following a calf diarrhea event. Now, whether that's because the calf diarrhea um, put an animal that was kind of on the cusp of just getting the right nutrients to now be in an immune challenge situation from a nutrient perspective, or whether it's simply just a consequence of the extra moisture being deposited in the environment with the scours uh, or some combination. But, it is pretty common to see this association where respiratory disease follows a week, two weeks, three weeks after a calf diarrhea event. All right, enough of a little bit of the background. Let's, let's talk a little bit about some growth targets here. So throughout the presentation this evening, I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna focus on Holsteins. It's not the only breed we deal with, but it's the majority of breeds. So. The, the majority of what I'm describing is directly applicable to Holsteins, and I'm gonna use Holstein growth targets throughout this process. So with that kind of backdrop, I'm gonna assume that as we try to set these growth targets, that the mature body weight that we're looking at within the animals we're looking at um, is about 700 kilos. Now, it will vary somewhat from herd to herd, but we need to understand what that is for a herd in order to set the appropriate growth targets for them. I'm also defining mature body weight as the average weight of fourth lactation animals at roughly 100 to 200 days in milk. And we, if we use that as a guideline, we can all be talking apples to apples uh, in terms of understanding what mature weight is. 
So utilizing that mature body weight as the basis for our comparisons, we're going to assume we want to try to breed these animals at roughly 55 to 57 percent of mature body weight. So you have a little range stated there for a 700 kilo mature weight um, herd. We'd also like these animals to be inseminated for the first time when they're about 85 to 90 percent of mature weight. So it's a lot different height wise versus weight. 85 to 90 percent of mature height, 55 to 57 percent of mature body weight. And ideally, again, from a cost perspective, we'd like to be able to get this done 13 to 15 months of age. There are some pros and cons to breeding earlier or later, but if you look at the overall opportunity cost and overall lifetime profitability, I think this 13 to 15 months is, is pretty much the sweet spot. Calving, we like these animals to calve in the day before calving, like them to be about 92 to 95 percent of mature body weight. Now I recognize that these animals are going to lose weight. They're going to, they're going to deliver their calf. They'll have the uh, placental, um, placenta uh, expulsed, and then they'll have the loss of fetal fluids. So as a consequence of that, they'll go from 92 to 95% of mature weight before calving to about 82 to 85% of mature weight the day after calving. So those are two different targets to look at depending on where the measurements are being taken for these animals. Mature body, uh, mature height, we want the, about 95% of that at calving. We want a body condition that's going to be on the moderate side, um, three to three and a quarter, and some people are even going two, seven, five to three on a five, one to five scale. At the very bottom of the slide, you can see the expected step ups in weight as we go from first calving to second calving to third calving. So again, these animals are gaining a bit of weight with each um, success of parity and um, second lactation, so at the start of second lactation, roughly 92% of mature body weight, and at the third calving, 96% of mature body weight, and of course by fourth you're going to be at the target body weight. Now what's necessary to meet those goals? So I put together this little um, uh, spreadsheet. This is an image of the spreadsheet, but on the left hand side you can see the different variables that I'm trying to measure. In the middle, I've got my inputs and outputs in um, pounds, and on the right-hand side, you see it in terms of kilos. So take a look where you're, wherever you're most comfortable. But if we start with a mature body weight input and a birth weight input, and then I'm going to make an assumption that we can feed these calves to gain what I consider to be uh, acceptable, uh, readily achievable, but not over the top gain of about 0.84 kilos per day. Again, if we're targeting an age at first service of about 13 and a half months, and we're going to limit our breeding window to no more than six 21-day cycles. Now, that may seem short to some. It may seem long to others. But the reality is we don't want to have a very long breeding window for these heifers because within we're perpetuating fertility challenges that carry over into lactation. We also end up having some other health issues with animals that conceive late. I don't have time to get into that in a lot of detail this evening, but just suffice it to say, I think it's a, our desired goal is to get these animals inseminated within five to six cycles and then basically stop trying. Weight at first service target, we're going to set at 56% of mature body weight here. Assume a gestation length of about 277 days. That puts us as an age at first calving on a minimum of about 22.6. So most of these heifers will be calving in around 23 months of age, which to me is pretty ideal. And again, our target's 92% of mature body weight just before calving or 83 just after. In order for all of that to take place, assuming we were able to achieve the 0.84 kilos per day pre-weaning, we need, for those early breeders, need a gain of about 0.87 kilos per day or higher from weaning to breeding. We need a gain from breeding to calving for the early breeders of about 0.9 kilos per day. Overall, just under 0.9 kilos from birth through first calving. Now, the, all of that was focused on making sure that the early breeders reached our targeted growth marks at calving. On the very bottom, you can see there's a wider range stated. And the wider range is meant to reflect the range that's possible depending on when the heifer is actually conceived. So if a heifer conceived right at 13 and a half months of age, 
and calved in at 22.6, yeah, we need to have that higher rate of gain uh, in order to meet those targets. If she was a slower breeder, then she has a little bit more leeway in terms of, of the gain, but we can't target the lower rates of gains because then we have animals calving early that are not of adequate size. So I just include that for completeness, but again, we've got some pretty lofty goals that we're gonna to try to meet these targets. Now, here's what it might look like in terms of actual data from a, a dairy. This is a large US dairy that's been feeding calves more aggressively for a number of years. And this is their weight curve, growth curve. So the lower, the bottom axis, you see the age in days and the, the vertical axis, you see the weight in kilos. And so I'm just gonna follow these animals from basically birth through about 650 days of age. During this time period, they've gone from roughly 40 kilos to about 600 kilos. So that's a gain of about 0.86 kilos per day on average. You look at the growth curve and it, it's mostly linear. It's not completely linear, but it's a little bit of curvilinear nature but it's definitely much more linear than a height growth curve. And if you look at the point in time where 50% of the weight gain has occurred, that's roughly 11 months. So approximately halfway through the growth process, okay? Now compare that to the height curve. This is the exact same herd, and you can see they're growing these heifers pretty well. Again, by about 600 days, they're at 1.4 meters on average, so good height gone from 0.8 to 1.4. But if we look at the point at which they have reached 50% of their height, it's by six months, not by 11 months. This is what I was talking, referring to earlier. These young animals are much more efficient at utilizing protein for the purposes of frame growth and lean tissue gain at an early age than they are at an older age. And so it behooves us to try to take advantage of this by feeding these calves better at an earlier age and then trying to maintain some of the growth as we as these heifers age. It's very difficult, very costly to try to catch up later in life um, to try to correct some animals that have not, have not been grown properly prior to, say, breeding. So what I more commonly see instead of the goals that I just showed you previously I more commonly see gains of about 0.68 kilos per day, um, animals being inseminated at about 50% of mature body weight. They're calving in just before calving at 85% of mature body weight or at 76% of mature body weight just after calving. And so the gains to meet those different targets are significantly lower than the ones identified before. But when it's all said and done, this results in a heifer that's at least 50 kilos or more lighter than our desired weight after calving. And that lighter weight, that smaller frame is significant. So why is it so important that heifers are grown better prior to first calving? <clears throat> Again, I've mentioned that cows don't typically reach their mature size until about the fourth lactation. If heifers weigh 82 to 85% of mature weight just after calving, they have a much lower level of growth required during the first lactation in order to try to be on target, so to speak. So look at this research that was published back in 2010. This is uh, out of uh, Virginia Tech University, but in this study, Holstein's calved with a post calving weight of about 555 kilos. And let's assume that the targeted weight was actually about 600 kilos because the mature body weight target for this herd is about 725, so a little bit larger than what we identified already. The researchers estimated that over the course of the, tip, the first lactation, approximately 7% of the total energy consumed by these first lactation animals was actually diverted to support growth. And these animals gained about 200 pounds in terms of frame and uh, body accretion. Now that 200 pounds of growth represent energy that was sufficient to support about 970 liters of milk. So imagine that if the calving weight had been 600 kilos instead of 555, and half of the energy that she used in the first lactation could have been diverted to milk instead of growth, that represents the potential for 485 liters more milk in the first lactation. So when we talk about animals coming in undersized, what we're really talking about 
is, an, is a lost opportunity within the first lactation. And unfortunately, in many cases, they may not always catch up over the remaining remainder of their lactational life. So I joke sometimes with, with people that say that, well, you can grow them before they calf or you can grow them after they calf. But in my opinion, if you look at the opportunity cost of a slot and the milking herd, I'd rather have heifers that are grown properly prior to first calving so that I can actually get the milk um, potential out of these animals right away instead of waiting to second or third lactation as the growth catches up with them. Now, lest you think I'm picking on UK herds, this is a global problem. And what I'm gonna show you now is some data from some US herds. One of the things that we do sometimes to illustrate this point is to compare the peak milk of first lactation animals to the peak milk of mature cows. And if you do this comparison, our goal is to be at 80 to 82% of the mature cows. Now I pulled a sample of 120,000 Holsteins from across the US and I looked at first lactation versus mature cows. So first lactation peaks was roughly 36 liters and the mature cow peaks was 48 liters. So in other words, if you do the math, that says that heifers are peaking at about 75% of mature cows. And that is very, very typical of what I see. Most commonly I see 75 to 77% with a few herds um, broaching 80 to 82%. But consider the potential if the peak had actually been at 80% of the mature cows. So 80% of the mature cows would take that 36 liter peak to 38 and a half. That means two and a half liters per day more at peak. And if we extrapolate what that means, an extra liter of peak is roughly about 250 liters more over the total lactation. That means that these animals, had they been brought in at the right size and reached their uh, first lactation peak target, that represents about 625 liters more first lactation milk. Again, that's a huge lost opportunity if we can't seize upon that um, by having these heifers managed and grown better. So again, how do we try to achieve those higher gains during the pre-weaning period and achieve good post-weaning performance? It actually starts well before calving, and we need some good transition cow management, which I'll highlight in just a minute. We need good feeding management. We'll talk about this as we go through the presentation this evening. We need, again, paying attention to management, and what I refer to as comfort potential. Uh, reduce the disease risk, as I've already mentioned, and of course, wean these animals appropriately. We're gonna cover each of these topics a little bit more detail as we move forward. First, let's look at the transition cow management. So, not a surprise, we're still targeting 50 to 60 days dry total. But, what, but if we have the ability to split that total dry into two different periods, it's great. And by that, I'm talking about 30 to 40 days in a far dry group and about three weeks in a close-up dry cow group. And if we can do these two group dry cow management approach, we're trying to control the energy throughout. It's just that in the far dry group, we're going to have even more limited energy than we will in the close-up. The other thing is that in the far dry period, we're trying to limit the amount of starch being provided to these animals in order to reduce their metabolic risk of disease after calving. The other thing that's important to remember, and this is a bit more challenging, is that we need to provide an adequate level of metabolizable protein. Now, if we look at the far dry period, um, that's not a big challenge, to be honest with you. Intakes are higher, so it's not very difficult to achieve 1,000 grams per day of metabolizable protein during a far dry. But the close-up may be the more difficult, most difficult ration to balance on the dairy because we've got a, a lower level of intake on average. We've got a limited level of starch, a limited level of energy. So our microbial protein production is not as good as we might expect or hope for. So in order to meet the goals of providing 1,200 to 1,400 grams per day of metabolizable protein, we actually have to feed some good quality protein to these prepartum animals. And that can be a big challenge, especially in animals calving for the first time where their intakes are even lower than the mature cows. The calving environment, um, no surprise here. We want a clean, dry, comfortable area with good footing so we don't have any uh, damage done to the animals. We want good air quality. Ideally, 
the cow should be separate from sick animals and have the ability to remove herself her, as she's calving from the larger group if possible, at least into a quieter corner, for example. And the other thing that's important whenever we design these facilities for calving is to think about our ability to intervene if, if necessary um, so that we can actually um, help deliver these animals um, to get a live calf and uh, hopefully avoid any additional trauma or damage to the cow herself. So all these things are important from a transition cow and calf management perspective. Care of the newborn also is important. And I'll start off with this little uh, image up on the right. When calves are born, we need to assess their vigor and resuscitate if needed. And I'll raise my hand. I've been guilty of that up on the upper right of sometimes hanging a calf upside down. I used to think I was doing a lot of good by having the fluid drain out of the calf. Unfortunately, that's not necessarily the case because much of the fluid we see drain through the calf's nostrils is actually coming from its abomasum when we hang it upside down. And the, the challenge we get into is getting that calf to take its first breath. Holding the calf upside down makes it much, much more difficult to expand its lungs the first time. And so it's much better to put the calf in sternal recumbency, to rub or massage the calf vigorously with a towel, and if it's not breathing, to stimulate it. And there's various ways of stimulating the calf to try to get it to breathe. There's the straw in the nostrils and, and rubbing it and so forth. But one of the most effective, based on a number of sources here, is simply ice cold water over the calf's head or in the ear. And what that does is just stimulates a gasp response, which causes that calf to kind of take its first breath. And after the first breath, typically um, the breathing becomes much more easier. Calf removal from the cow. That's a controversial topic. I'm not gonna get into that in a lot of detail, other than to say my personal preference is to remove the calf from the dam once the calf is trying to stand, but before it suckles. And again, that's my personal preference, and that's simply from a risk management perspective. I want the calf in place long enough for the cow to lick it, because I think both the cow and the calf benefit from the nursing behavior, the, the the licking behavior of the cow onto the calf. But once the calf starts to get up and struggle around looking for that teat, I'd prefer to remove it and provide a set amount of colostrum in a clean, sanitized manner, as opposed to taking a chance of the calf getting manure or anything else in its mouth while it's trying to suckle. Plus, unfortunately, we've kind of brought out some of the nursing behavior um, of uh, our calves and our cows. And so the average Holstein calf is not going to suckle enough to get enough colostrum if we allow it simply to suckle the, the dam. When we remove the calf, or if we're going to leave the calf longer, we either way, we want to disinfect the navel. And again, the preference here is using uh, strong iodine, not teat dips. We don't want to provide any emollient solutions to keep the navel moist. In fact, we're trying to dry it out more quickly. And of course, we want to warm and dry the calf. And depending on the environment and the environmental conditions, that might require some type of a heated area and might require a blanket, or it might just require putting it on a nice, clean, dry straw. Um, but there are different ways depending on the, the environment that these animals are exposed to. And of course, we can't forget about colostrum. So colostrum feeding and handling guidelines, in general, we want to harvest colostrum as quickly as possible and administer it as quickly as possible after birth. All right, I'm going to admit right away, I grew up on a 60-cow dairy. I know this is extremely difficult, if not impossible, to do within the first couple of hours. But I'm just saying that in general, we need to encourage our producers to harvest colostrum as soon as they can and get colostrum into the calf as quickly as possible. And this is much easier on a larger dairy where you've got around the clock milking and much, much more difficult on a smaller dairy. I fully recognize that. But regardless of when we can do this, we want to make sure we're feeding clean colostrum. Um, now colostrum can be pasteurized, but it's important to emphasize to our producers that we want to have clean colostrum because pasteurizing filthy colostrum, all it does is lower the bacteria count. It doesn't make it truly acceptable. So we want to harvest it cleanly pasteurize it carefully if pasteurization is chosen to be the management process. 
but be very, very careful not to exceed 60 degrees Celsius or you definitely damage the colostrum. Again, feed the colostrum as soon as possible after birth. Use good quality colostrum. I'll we'll talk about that more in just a minute. Excess colostrum can be refrigerated for two or three days or frozen. If it's frozen, it needs to be um, cooled down quickly, frozen preferably in kind of a flat position so that it freezes more quickly and so it can be warmed more quickly. And warming should be done with uh, warm water or hot water, not microwaves, not cooking it, uh, else you damage some of the components. <clears throat> now in terms of the colostrum quality and quantity, <clears throat> our goal is more than 50 grams per liter of IgG in the colostrum. And we can assess colostrum in a variety of ways. But probably the most uh, popular one now is the use of a BRICS refractometer. And when it's calibrated appropriately, we're using the 22% cut point on BRICS to approximate roughly the cut point for 50 grams per liter of IgG. Remember, we're not directly measuring IgG here, but it's, uh, it's been uh, correlated pretty well with that level. So that's our targeted level for minimum threshold for retaining for first feeding. There are many factors that affect colostrum quality, including our vaccination program and our housing and nutritional program. Um, uh, short dry periods contributes to poor quality and lower quantity of colostrum. And again, we'd like to, as I've already mentioned, try to collect colostrum as soon after calving as possible. Now, what about some of the feeding goals? This is where we're gonna see a little bit of a difference of opinion, but I've included both here for the sake of completeness. Your UK guidelines are three liters at birth followed by two more liters within 12 hours for a typical Holstein size calf. In the US, I typically recommend four liters, but I understand that from a, a, a welfare concern in the UK, the preference or the recommendation is to provide three liters at birth and then two more liters within 12 hours. Both components are important the initial feeding of three or four liters followed by two more within 12 hours. And the other thing to remember, this is most commonly in the US done with uh, tube feeders because most calves are not voluntarily gonna consume more than about two liters either from the cow or from a bottle. And to be honest, on the larger dairies, we usually don't have the patience or the time to stand and continue to support a calf. So that's why a lot of producers will just default to administering the, the three or four liters with the bottle right away. And again, to me, that's just a risk management approach to ensure the calf got it. And again, following up to two, uh, two more liters in about 12 hours. Now, what I've been focusing on is the good quality colostrum for the initial feeding. What I used to tell my students is that even if colostrum had no IgGs, it would still be a valuable feed to provide to the calf. And the reason for that is the nutrient content. So if you look at colostrum in the column, labeled colostrum versus milk in the, in the far right column, you can see there are a lot of big differences simply from a nutritional perspective. Colostrum is much higher in solids, it's higher in fat, it's much, much higher in protein. It's also lower and lactose, and that's important because calves typically don't tolerate lactose very well right at birth. Now, we're also talking about the transition milk. I mentioned that a few minutes ago. Transition milk is simply referring to that milk that's in between colostrum and normal milk. So colostrum doesn't go instantly from being colostrum to milk. It kind of goes through this transition. So feeding that transition milk for the next two, three, four days actually provides additional benefits for the calf uh, over and above feeding simply milk during that time point. And some of the benefits are explained by the differences in the nutrient contents as shown in the top half of this table. But the other benefits are highlighted in the lower half. In the lower half, you can see things like IGF-1, growth hormone, insulin, these are natural growth factors, natural factors that, that the mom puts into colostrum, into her transition milk, that serve as some key signaling mechanisms for the calf. And uh, the belief, the research is starting to show that these growth factors are key 
you know, impacting the development of tissues like the gastrointestinal tract and probably have positive carryover effects on future mammary function and production. So the administration of larger volumes of colostrum early on, followed by the feeding of transition milk, has very important ramifications, not only on that young calf's health and welfare, but its long-term production potential as well. So practical application, again, we're looking at that three to four liters at birth, followed by two more liters within 12 hours. Remember that the quality of colostrum declines with delays in milking and the absorption declines with delays in administering or feeding it. Um, we wanna feed that transition milk over the next three or four days after colostrum if possible. And again, we're trying to focus on capitalizing both on the nutritional benefits, the local IgA that might be protective in the local gut itself, as well as the different growth factors, non-nutritive factors to enhance this calf's growth development and long-term productivity. All right, we're gonna shift from talking about some really good stuff to talking about some bad stuff. And when I say bad stuff, I'm talking about how we historically often fed calves. I've jokingly, it's probably not a good joke, but I've jokingly referred to this as a semi-starvation approach of feeding calves. In the past, it was pretty common in many farms to feed four liters a day, so two liters morning, two liters in the evening, of a 20-20 milk replacer mixed at about 11.5 or 12% solids. And the reason people did that is it lowered their milk replacer cost because they fed less milk. It promoted the calves to eating starter at an earlier time so they could actually wean calves earlier. So all that sounds kind of good until you look a bit deeper. The problem is we had many health problems and we had poor growth with this approach. Yeah, it was cheaper in that current cash flow evaluation, but the problem is we ran into many health problems. We had poor growth. We actually had some additional mortality um, that's really not, should not be considered acceptable. Consider the scenario for a 40 kilo calf when the, the temperature is about 22 degrees C. Four liters of 2020 milk replacer per day has enough nutrients to support a little less than 200 grams per day of gain. But if you add in a little cold weather, rainy weather, now the calf doesn't have enough nutrients to even maintain its body weight and they'll actually lose weight. In the intestinal picture you see the, in the middle of your, your slide there, the thing to point out here or to notice is the absolute total lack of any fat in the intestines of this calf on necropsy. This calf basically utilized all of its internal fat stores to support its own energy demands because it was not receiving enough nutrients given the environmental conditions and the pathogen load it was experiencing. And thus this calf ended up having no internal fat stores. And that's something we should not accept as being uh, normal. So during cold conditions, calves need more milk, yes, more colostrum, yes, but they also need management intervention. And by that, I mean sufficient bedding in order to nest. So here's two images of uh, warm and comfortable calves. The top one, you can see a calf that's fitted with a clean, dry uh, calf jacket. That's great if you can manage those. The bottom, you see calves that are resting comfortably in a group setting in clean, dry straw that's in sufficient quantity that allows these calves to actually nestle down into the straw. And the key to uh, observation takeaway from this picture is that you cannot see these calves' legs. The la legs are actually nestled down into the straw. That's why I refer to as nesting. And that's what we should be striving for, especially in the colder conditions so that calves can help uh, thermoregulate themselves a bit better. This picture on the left is a really nice clean and dry picture of a calf in a calf hutch as long as it's not during winter conditions. If we're late spring, summer, early fall, that may be ideal. It's nice, clean, dry. We've got some airflow going through that from front to back. But if this is in the winter time, this calf that has no ability to help thermoregulate itself beyond what it gets from its calories consumed from milk.
<clears throat> so I've talked about the benefits of colostrum and transition milk feeding and how that yields better growth and better future milk production. Now, now the, the research behind this or the evidence behind it is, is multifold. There's a lot of studies out there showing strong associations between pre-weaning gain and future productivity. Depending on the study, you can see benefits from basically nothing to over 1,400 kilos of milk in the first lactation. Fernando Soberon and Mike Van Amberg at uh, Cornell University used some regression techniques to actually evaluate what the range of gain looked like given, uh, well, the relationship between gain pre-weaning and first lactation milk production. And what they concluded was that for every tenth of a kilo increase in pre-weaning average daily gain, milk yield increased by 154 kilos. So again, going back to my earlier slide about the difference between simply doubling birth weight or slightly exceeding that rate of gain, that's a difference right there of about 300 liters more in milk in first lactation. So that's again, further reason to try to encourage this additional feeding and uh, promote this growth in these young calves. So whether that benefit is because of better health or because of some programming from growth factors on the GI tract or their mammary gland, I don't know. But uh, there's a pretty strong association between that. So that's why we encourage uh, better pre-weaning average daily gain and, and more milk feeding. So some suggestions around the milk feeding phase. Um, I tend to suggest that people increase solids of the milk to about 14%. Normally solids in the whole milk would be somewhere around 125 12.8%. So we're increasing the solids to about 14, but I don't want to go much higher than that because of the concern around the osmolality issues. Um, we want to use a high quality replacer with good digestible ingredients or even whole milk. Um, that's got higher protein and acceptable fat, to, especially in the winter. We're gonna to try to target feeding um, 12 to 15% of mature body weight during the first week of life. So that's three liters twice a day. And that's six liters of 14% solids is about 840 grams of milk solids. We're gonna ramp them up pretty quickly, starting around eight days of age to about 20% of body weight. So here I'm targeting three plus liters fed three times a day or four liters twice a day. My preference is the nine liters total, so three, three times a day. Um, but nine liters of 14% solids is about 1260 grams of milk solids. You can see we have the capacity here to support an increased rate of gain in these young calves. We're gonna to try to maintain the nine liters until about day 50. We don't wanna start weaning too early. And then we're gonna lower the milk to two liters twice a day for a week, and then cut it in half again, whether that's one liter twice a day or two liters once a day, depends on management preferences. And then try to wean these calves somewhere 64 to 70 days. But we're gonna make sure we're weaning them once we are confident their starter grain intake is at least one to two kilos per day for three consecutive days. And that intake is not sufficient to meet their needs, but it simply represents that the calf is physically able to eat enough grain to meet its needs. So as it comes off milk, its intake will increase. Now, if you're talking to your producers about feeding higher levels of milk, it, it pays to warn them if they're not already feeding higher levels that there's some things that'll look a little different. Number one, feeding more properly mixed, clean, high quality milk does not cause scours. True, you will see feces being a little softer than normal and much greater volume, but that's not abnormal. That's actually normal and the calf is drinking a lot of milk. It does not mean the calves have diarrhea. And again, think about a newborn baby that's nursing a lot. They have loose to pasty stools. We have let abnormal become normal too much when we expect calves to have dry, firm feces when they're on milk. They have dry, firm feces because we're not providing enough fluids in their, their diet from milk. The other thing to be aware of is that calves are gonna be eating very little starter early on. That contributes to softer feces, but as they increase the starter intake, they'll start to firm up the feces a bit more. And it's also important to remember these calves should always have access to free, fresh, clean water. Just a quick note on sanitation. Um, this is from Sam Leadley, who's uh, up in the Northeast. He's a, a calf and heifer consultant. 
his recommendations for feeding, uh, cleaning the feeding equipment is to first rinse with lukewarm water, not hot water, you're trying to get off the dirt and uh, milk residue. I'm gonna wash with hot water and add a detergent and bleach or some type of chlorinated detergent. And the key here he emphasizes this is brushing the surfaces to make sure you get the milk residue removed. And then he likes to recommend a rinse with the warm water acid solution, something like a clean in place acid solution that would be used uh, for the milking equipment. And he suggests that not to even rinse that, uh, rinse that off of the, the utensils, but to leave it on, let it dry. But the key here is drying, drying the pails, drying the bottles, drying the nipples. Um, I've seen many problems occur when people stack stuff together so it can't dry out, or they'll leave them soaking in a bucket until the next feeding. And those solutions often become contaminated and just breed filth. So I prefer to rec I recommend that, that we get all the utensils dried as, uh, as quickly as possible after the disinfectant. <clears throat> now, in terms of rumen development and feeding, I was talking about how one of the big issues we deal with is the transition from milk to grain. It's important to remember and to remind your producers that calves are not born with functioning rumens. They have to grow those rumens and develop them in order to actually function as a ruminant. At birth, the abomasum is by far the largest component of the four parts to the stomach. And so while that calf is on a liquid diet, she start, slowly starts eating grain and drinking water, getting some bacteria inoculated in there, fermenting some of this grain. All of that is what's required to stimulate the development of the rumen, but that does take time. It could take weeks to months for that development to, to take place. And in this middle picture, we're showing that by three or four months, the rumen is greatly expanded in size, but it's still not to its full size until uh, later in life. But starter management is critical to avoid the, the dips we see in performance around weaning and to help develop this rumen. We need to do what we can to encourage uh, starter grain intake early to help promote rumen development. We have to remind ourselves that calves prefer textured uh, starters, pellets uh, with um, cut grain, corn, oats, and then molasses is kind of what calves prefer. They don't like starter grains that have lots of fines and dust. And of course they, like everyone else, prefer fresh feed versus um, moldy or, or wet or damaged feeds. We also have to remember that we're trying to partially initially and then fully later replace milk. Milk's got a high quality, high level of protein. So it stands to reason we want to feed a higher quality protein in our calf starter. So something in the neighborhood of 22, 23% crude protein on dry matter basis makes sense here, along with molasses from fermentability and from a taste perspective. And I like to offer it very early on, two or three days of age, very small amount, replace it daily to keep it fresh. And as the calf starts nibbling, you increase how much you provide. <coughs> but make sure the calf always has, of course, fresh free choice water. I've already mentioned how the weaning management can undo many of the good things that have happened with the milk fed diet. Because we're trying to transition from milk to non-milk diet, there are some hiccups that can take place and this is more complicated than most people think. Um, I've already talked about the differences in protein and protein quality. So we got to remember that this calf is adapting from these good quality nutrients to a lower quality nutrient. And she's got a rumen that's just starting to kind of function, but it's not really um, reaching its full fermentation capability yet. So she's continuing to develop that. And that development requires ongoing ingestion of starch. So we can't just expect the calf to start eating one week and the next week be weaned and be ready to go. That just does not happen. It takes a certain amount of starch exposure within the rumen to get this full development to take place. Usually I recommend weaning uh, somewhere between eight and 10 weeks of age, but that's based on starter intake. And as I've already mentioned, we don't want to wean these calves until starter grain consumption is sufficiently high. And when we do this, we're going to be tapering down the milk. And I, I tell people that the higher the level of milk being fed at peak during the milk feeding phase, the longer the step down needs to be. 
and the slower that transition needs to be so that we can ease her over onto the green. <clears throat> I also like to keep calves separated for seven to 10 days after weaning just so we can monitor and ensure their intake and then move them into small group pens, preferably in even numbers of similar size and age if possible. And then I like to feed the same or very similar grain mix for the next five to seven days so that we minimize the changes that take place all at one time to, to lower some of the stresses on these calves. All right, we've talked about what we should be doing. And now what I'm gonna do is shift gears and talk about a consequence of maybe things that didn't happen the way we wanted. Here I'm focusing on respiratory disease. So I'm going to refer to this often as BRD, sometimes as pneumonia, but we're talking about the same thing here. Um, the consequences of BRD can vary. Um, some of these consequences are immediate, of course, in terms of changes in intake. Um, calves appear obtunded. They have a reduced rate of gain. We have treatments, and of course we have mortality. But we also have some delayed consequences. We may have subsequent retreatments that are necessary. These animals have a higher culling risk, either as heifers, or if we fail to cull them as heifers, we'll see more likely a higher culling risk as a first lactation animal. We can see delays in uh, first service and delays in first calving. There's also the potential for carryover effects into first lactation. And I'll talk about that a bit more um, as we move forward. Now, to better understand the impact and the cost of BRD, I built an economic model. And I have to admit, I did this at the request of an outside group. Um, the Respiratory Disease Symposium that's held in the USC every year, they asked me to, if I would take a, a stab at trying to understand the, the cost of a respiratory disease, and I said, sure, why not? So what I did was I tried to adapt an existing replacement heifer growth model I had to allow for comparison of a group of heifers with BRD versus a group of heifers without BRD across a full period from birth to calving. <clears throat> now, these heifers were followed from birth through six full stages of growth and development, so essentially going from 24 hours of age up until calving. Now, the housing and feeding in my model was adapted and changed to be more representative of a typical system in your geography. I'm assuming I've got indoor housing of young heifers. I've got 100% <clears throat> milk replacer being fed during the pre-winning period, and that milk replacer is a 2618, and I'm feeding a 22% calf starter grain. A calf grain and hay as initial grower ration, followed by a grass silage-based TMR for older heifers. All my cost, my ration cost, ingredient cost, and uh, other information came from a small survey I did of uh, some producers and nutritionists, as well as some information from AHDB, and then my own ration cost estimation. So the other assumptions used in the model, again, this is a whole scene dairy I'm trying to replicate. Now this is a smaller dairy. They have about 100 total heifers. Uh, we're gonna assume a newborn heifer value of about 174 pounds sterling, we got a birth weight of 39 kilos, labor cost of 11 pounds per hour, and an interest or cost of capital of 6%. <clears throat> breeding weight is assumed to be 56% of a 700 kilo mature body weight. AI cost was set at 16 pounds per service. Animals could be at risk for breeding for six 21 day cycles. I assume no differences in fertility between the two groups. Overall, there's a 38% 21 day preg rate. Now, my respiratory disease incidence was set at 37%. This is the incidence of BRD, a cumulative incidence prior to 120 days of age. I got this number by sampling a number of farm records. It was about 104,000 dairy heifers that I looked at in the US. And in that sample population, these animals had on average 1.7 treatments per incident case of BRD. Now this is describing the actual breakdown of when the cases occurred. So the left side, you see the age category. Then you see first case, second case, third case, and fourth case. And the numbers below that represent the number of cases within each category by age group. On the right side, you see two columns, cumulative incidence and total risk. Cumulative incidence represents the proportion of animals 
with a first time case divided by, well, it's the number of animals first time case divided by the animals at risk. So you can see overall, approximately 37% had a first case by 120 days of age. And after 120 days of age, there were very few new cases. The total risk by 120 uh, is 62%. So that's where the 1.7 cases per animal came in, um, came from. And you can see subsequent additional relapses after that. But the key I'm trying to point out here is that due to the scarcity of new cases after 120 days of age, I made the decision to focus my cost estimation on new cases occurring through 120 days of age. So that's what the base, basis of this model is. <clears throat> now, the challenge here was trying to take research from various sources and pull it together into one comprehensive model. So what I did was I modified the growth curve in the existing model to account for the decrease expected uh, due to BRD, but you can't simply subtract the gains due to BRD from the average. What I had to do was actually factor in um, a, a slight increase in gain for the animals without BRD, and from that subtract out the loss of gain for the animals with BRD. So the very bottom half of this slide points out first in the middle, you see in blue or purple, the average daily gain by stage. And then above it, you can see my modeled daily gain for animals without BRD. And below it, you can see the model daily gain for animals with BRD. And so overall, the very end, they kind of come together a little bit, but that's after mortality and after some culling of the more severely affected animals. Early on, you see the biggest gap in daily gain kilos per day, 0.82 versus 0.74. Now, the cumulative incidence, as I said, was 36.6% and a total incidence of 62.2. Uh, but 62% of the incident cases occurred by 60 days. On total, 1.7 treatments per case, and the treatment in the model was considered to be a weight-based treatment protocol consisting of an extended therapy macrolide. I assumed an 8% case fatality risk that had some incremental mortality risk by stage. Um, and I also assumed 50% uh, of the deaths in this BRD population were directly attributable to BRD. I also assumed that there was some culling that took place. So 10% of the incident cases were culled to the beef market two weeks after movement into the subsequent growth stage and an additional 10% of repeat treatments were removed after 10 months of age. And all of this is consistent with published uh, work. So this is a big table showing lots of information. Uh, we're not gonna go through all this in detail, but in the very middle in blue, you can see the original mortality risk assumed for the entire blended population. So 5% pre-weaning and 11% total mortality risk from birth to calving. So the no BRD animals, you can see their adjusted mortality risk in bold and black above the blue. And then the mortality risk for those animals with uh, BRD are below. So you can see there's quite a bit of a difference. And when it's all said and done, the mortality risk in the BRD animals was 1.7 times higher than the animals without BRD. Now, in terms of culls, I assumed that there were some culls due to reproductive failure. So in the no BRD animals, that's 6% total. But the BRD animals not only had the, re the reproductive culls, but they had additional culls due to poor performance. So overall, the culling risk prior to first calving was 2.7 times higher in the BRD animals. So when you look at the impact of culls, that's a big, um, big impact on both the cost of raising and on future productivity. So if we fail to call animals that are so prior to first calving, we can expect a higher culling risk after those animals calf for the first time. But if we cull heifers prior to first calving, we are also incurring economic losses due to the large differences um, often uh, between the investments made and the returns received. 
So in this scenario, what I'm assuming is that I've got animals being called during stage two, three, and four. And I've estimated the cost of raising a heifer to that point of being called. I looked at the beef value expected to be received. And in all three cases, there was a large loss per heifer called. Now, one of the reasons for that is I used values that were given to me out of the UK system, but I discounted those by 25% to account for the low value that would be expected to be received because of the sale of poor quality animals. Uh, and perhaps 25% discount is too conservative, but that's what I used here. Now, if we look at first lactation differences between animals with and without BRD, um, it's very difficult and inconsistent to get a good reading on this. And the reason is there's almost always some level of culling bias introduced. In other words, the worst affected animals either die or get sold. And so we're left trying to measure the impact of those survivors in first lactation. So what I did to try to account for that in the model is I assumed there was no differences in first lactation other than that that was predicted by the differences in average daily gain prior to weaning between the two groups. And again, going back to the Soberon regression equation, we predicted about 122 kilos less milk due to differences in daily gain pre-weaning between the two groups. And if I look at that <coughs> using these assumptions, that comes out to a net impact of about 21 pounds of income over feed cost differences between those with BRD and those without. Now, if you would assume for a minute that no selective culling was actually performed, then the milk losses and productive life would most definitely be more negatively impacted. So perhaps this is conservative, but that's the, the, the route I chose to take in this particular model. So this is the overall cost of raising estimates by stage and by category. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of detail on this. I'm happy to provide some of this later if anyone wants to see it. Overall, I estimated the average cost per heifer calving to be 1,763 pounds. That's using all the other inputs. It's accounting for the, the investments made in those that died or were sold. It also accounts for the, for the interest cost, the investment cost throughout the whole operation. But what I wanted to point out to you briefly is the differences between the animals with no BRD, shown on the top here, and those with BRD. So the difference between those two populations is 168 pounds. And that is without consideration of any first lactation milk loss. If I add in the 21 pounds of less income over feed costs due to the production differences, it brings my cost of BRD up to 189 pounds per animal uh, originally infected. So this is per incident case is how this is expressed. It's not per animal treated because some animals were repeated or were treated multiple times. This is per incident case. So on average, the BRD cost of 189 pounds per incident case. So in summary, wrapping this thing up, now, there are many health issues in calves and heifers that can be prevented with better man management. I hope the emphasis here was taken that management is key, focus on prevention versus detect and treat. But all these things include colostrum, basic nutritional management, housing, air quality, our wean weaning management, and overall preventive health. Under the assumptions I use in the model here that I share with you this evening, BRD cost and Holstein replacement heifers in a UK system that I modeled here resulted in about 189 pounds cost per case, or 168 if you do not um, account for the reduction in milk production and first lactation. Those cost estimates assume that poor performing heifers were culled prior to first calving. So if that is not the case, then I'm assuming that the carry, negative carrier effects of BRD are likely to be much greater. And you're actually gonna end up expecting to see even more milk losses and a greater 
risk of premature removal in first lactation as a consequence of calving these um, affected animals into the herd. So that's what I have for you this evening. I'll uh, go back to the slide reminding you of the tools and resources from AHDB. And I've finished up with my uh, normal picture of my family. Now I've started including my uh, new grandson in picture with my wife and I. So I'm now old enough to be a grandfather. So anyway, thanks for your attention and staying with me uh, this evening. I hope uh, it was of value to you. And if there's questions or time for questions, I'm happy to try to answer those. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Mike. That was absolutely fantastic presentation. Um, absolutely packed with really useful um, practical tips on how we can help steer farmers towards uh, improved um, heifer rearing and lower bovine respiratory disease. Um, we have got time. We, we, we were meant to wrap up at nine, but um, we will take some, some questions. So please, if you have any, then just pop them into the, the Q&A box. Um, and just as well, before we leave tonight, um, if I could just ask everybody watching just to spare 30 seconds to complete the feedback survey um, before you sign off, it should have popped up in a new tab in your browser. But if for any reason that it hasn't, you can also contact us with any feedback that you've got at office at cattlebet.co.uk. So over to our first question. Um, Mike, a question about engaging farmers. Um, in the UK, we have some fantastic research showing that we really are not doing well enough when it comes to heifer rearing. Yet we still are battling um, engagement with farmers. And this is what this is an initiative is really about. What would your top tip be for getting farmers to understand the importance um, of heifer rearing and starting that conversation towards improvements? That's a really great question. And it's one that I've battled with over the years, to be honest with you. I'll tell you a quick little side story. When I was in private practice back in the early 90s, I tried to approach one of my producers with the idea of feeding heifers more aggressively to try to get better gains. And I could not get past his reluctance to spend, he was focusing only on the cost per day of feeding a better quality grain or feeding more milk. He was not looking at the long sight of what that impact had on his bottom line down the road. So I think that my own personal opinion is we have to figure a way to, um, to trigger or to motivate producers in whatever way is important to them. Sometimes it's looking at the relationship in their own herd of animals that have had historical disease issues to point out, hey, these animals truly are not performing as well as they should, and why might that be, and try to lead him to that, that answer himself. Uh, the other thing was just showing uh, a number of different resources that talk about the relationship between early growth and future productivity. Um, and the other thing I do is uh, go back to um, talk about my kids, my grandkids. I only have one grandson, but the idea is that if I want them to have the best, most healthy and uh, productive life, we're going to make sure they're fed and cared for very well. Why would that be any different with our calves? They're our investment in the future. So uh, I'm not sure I really answered that very well, but we just have to figure out different motivating factors because everybody's a bit different and then try to show it within their own system, I think, in addition to using the published research to back us up. Brilliant. Thank you very much. That did answer the question. Um, another question here that's come in. Um, you mentioned pasteurization of colostrum and transition milk. How do you or what do you feel? Um, how important do you feel that is in terms of reducing mycoplasma bovis risk? That's a that's another good one. I, I don't have really good data on mycoplasma bovis. Um, to me, there would be some um, some at least some uh, reduction in pathogen load from that. But if we look at mycoplasma bovis, that's basically the one that's endogenous to animals. And while we might reduce its load then. I would not count on that as being my primary source of reducing the spread within animals. So I'm not sure that would be my primary means for doing that. 
I personally prefer not to pasteurize if we can harvest colostrum cleanly and keep it clean because I think there's a lot of other factors in there that we don't even truly fully understand now compared to uh, heat treated um, colostrum. So to me, the heat treatment is a backup safety mechanism if I can't get clean colostrum any other way. Um, but I don't have a good research paper to cite to say that it reduces uh, mycoplasma by X percent. I apologize for that. I just, I'm just not aware of that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I suppose the emphasis there is making sure we get everything right, first of all, so we don't need to fall back on, on things like pasteurization. Um, Absolutely. Yep. Brilliant. So there, just we'll finish up with this one final question. Um, you've mentioned an awful lot of different factors which can affect how successfully uh, how successful we are in rearing heifers in your experience from traveling all around the world which do you find is the most common weakest link on farm <laughs> um probably the, the i'll point out two of them i think that one is simply underestimating the value of good nutritional management that's whether that's milk feeding or the transition in the weaning process. And the other is um, not being fully aware of all the issues around the housing system itself, whether it's overcrowding, whether it's air quality issues. Um, and then the fact that we have periods of the year where we know we're going to have stocking density challenges because of, you know, unequal calving pressures and we basically fail to plan and as a result we end up having more problems as a result of this um, overcrowding of our calves and heifers. I've seen that over and over again whether it's calves, whether it's heifers, whether it's transition cows um, is simply not preparing for the different changes in calving pressure or fluctuations in numbers across time. Brilliant, thank you very much. So I think we'll probably wrap it up there for the questions. Um, but uh, I just wanted to say again, before we sign off, um, thanks again um, so much for such an excellent webinar tonight. Um, as Steve mentioned earlier on in the introductions, um, everybody listening will be receiving further information about the follow-up webinar that Mike will be doing next week. Um, and we'll also make sure that you've got access to recording of tonight as well, in case you want to, to have a recap. Um, but once again, thanks very much to AHDB, Steve, and also to Mike uh, for making tonight happen. And to everyone listening, until next time, take care and good night.